Hi, it's me, John Doyle. I'd like to show you a couple things before we get started today that you'll find are actually very pertinent to the video. The first is my left hand. This was the hand that was used inadvertently to mess up the audio on the video today. I feel very badly about this, and what's more interesting is that there was actually a joke in the video that was something to the effect of, hey, we might need to start employing pain as an incentive for me to meet the standard that we all know that I should be operating at. That leads us to the second thing, which is this steel exterior door. It's very heavy, and when it shuts, it shuts hard. I think we know where this is going. I view this as my commitment to you and to making good content. I will now give the door to my cameraman, who's going to slam it on my hand. Do it. Ah, ah, ah. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has been setting a great example for how governments should be run in red states, and naturally, many Republicans have started to fantasize about a DeSantis 2024 scenario, with early polling showing that DeSantis dominates the prospective competition in that scenario, provided that Donald Trump does not run again in 2024, in which case, Trump would be the clear and obvious frontrunner. And I like Ron DeSantis a lot. I think he's a stand-up guy. I think he's done a lot of good stuff, so don't think that I'm attacking him, because I'm not. But as you know, my governing philosophy is essentially that everything with which I agree that is being promoted by people I like is so true. But if it's being promoted by people I don't like, then it's a psyop. Think of it as an amendment to the friend-enemy distinction. Remember what Reagan said, trust but verify. It's called we do a little trusting but verifying, because I've noticed that a lot of people who aren't our friends are promoting DeSantis, and so I've given it some thought, I've run the numbers. Be sure to watch all the way through, because I do have some nice things to say about DeSantis, and I don't want you to think that I'm attacking him, that I'm anti-DeSantis, because I'm not, but we're going to go over the truth about DeSantis, Trump, their similarities and differences, how the establishment perceives them, if they're actually a threat to the establishment, why our enemies are propping up DeSantis, how we basically predicted all of this last year, how to navigate the future of right-wing governments in this country, and much more. No one else will tell you this information, but I do it because I love you. Do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. I'm going to have to do something pretty soon. Like, if I don't upload at least two videos a week for a whole month, then I have to post a video of me, like, getting lit up with a bunch of paintball guns at close range as punishment. That might be good content, right? I could go to a football field wearing close to nothing and just have a bunch of members from the website just leave a bunch of welts and cuts and bruises all over me because I haven't posted content. Is that the incentive we need? This is really a powerful gesture, Mr. Doyle. It'll set quite an example. Now, you're making a big mistake. I, I have to be on camera. I can't have facial scarring. You said you'd say that. The homophobic treatise is imminent, okay? You told us you'd say that, too. Okay, look, I get it. I do. But posting a video of myself getting injured in some quasi-masochistic shit post-ritual, it's bad optics, okay? It will diminish people's inclination to take us seriously. You said you would definitely say that. Regardless, we do have a few good videos lined up, but I have to be careful in the near future because if attracted some unwanted attention, nothing we can handle, but we just have to take it easy for a second. So for today, we're going to hit on DeSantis because he has risen to the level of what I would regard as like the top five key players in right-wing politics alongside people like Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson, and then I'll leave the other two slots for debate. But the first thing that I want to say is that DeSantis embodies very well the two prerequisites necessary for a successful, positive right-wing media campaign. So if you're going to prop somebody up, if you're going to promote somebody uh, in the right, then they're going to need these two characteristics. They decide whether it could be done successfully, and then there's a third characteristic that decides uh, whether it will be done at all. And so the first two characteristics are basically one, vaguely positive political instincts, and two, ability and inclination to dunk on the lips. You might think that in order for right-wing media to rally behind you that you have to be like really, really ideological, really principled, but that's really not necessary. You basically just have to have vaguely right-wing political instincts, which both DeSantis and Trump have. Um, and then the second characteristic, which they also both have, is especially important. You have to be able to own the libs. And perhaps counterintuitively, this isn't even done necessarily to demoralize the libs, but more obviously to obfuscate and masquerade our own demoralization. I used to think that it was all like clickbait to make people feel good about themselves, but honestly, like, it might just be that there are people in this country, good people, who simply could not handle processing the reality of how bad things have gotten. We might literally need videos of Ron DeSantis tearing apart false COVID media narrative to prevent mass baby boomer suicide. We might unironically need these theatrical, viral, political victories in order to prevent total collapse of the American right. But maybe collapse would be good. Anyways, um, it's especially important because people right now are rightfully frustrated at the establishment media, the establishment politicians. And so when you've got a guy in there who will basically not tolerate their BS, it is nice to see. And you can actually pinpoint the exact moments 
um, at which this metamorphosis occurred, at least in my opinion, by watching the debate exchanges in 2016 between people like Donald Trump and Jeb Bush, and then Chris Christie and Marco Rubio. Like, Donald Trump had that less polished, more raw, masculine, tell-it-like-it-is energy, and he single-handedly destroyed Jeb Bush's political ambitions, and it was beautiful. And Chris Christie did the same thing. Remember that one exchange where Rubio repeated the memorized speech again after he was called out for it? It was a massacre. Chris Christie ended his whole campaign that night, and so that's the key distinction. If you want a future in right-wing politics, you have to read The Room. And The Room has no respect for the establishment because the establishment has failed them. And they are correct and that the establishment doesn't deserve their respect. And that's why anybody, anybody who maintains that we need to bring back respectable political discourse and people with good temperament and principles, anybody who says anything like that, the DC types, they are too busy masturbating to their own self-image to read The Room. That's what that is. These are the people who would wear suits to school and advertise themselves as the political kid. I'm a political junkie. And they have this artificially constructed image of what politicians should be like. And that's the only reason for it, because their own self-image requires it. These types of people are the same types of people who have occupied these institutions for decades and who have done nothing because they are too busy masturbating to the idea of being a DC operative. We don't need people masturbating, okay? We need people who are baiting the media, baiting journalists. We need masturbators, not masturbators. Which way, Western man? That being said, <laughs> the characteristic that ultimately decides whether uh, the person in question will be propped up as a figure is whether the establishment perceives them to be a threat. And it's different with politicians and media figures. So like someone like Tucker Carlson is going to have influence regardless. He's on Fox News. He gets millions of people watching him every night. He is the media, right? He's already in people's faces. But what decides whether a political figure will be put into people's faces, I believe, is ultimately whether the establishment perceives them to be a threat. Look at the way they treated Trump in 2016. Obviously, the left gave him overwhelmingly negative coverage, but there were even right-wing media outlets who criticized him incessantly, who berated him, who said that he wasn't a real conservative, etc., etc. And coincidentally, I'm sure, these outlets are also the outlets who have faced the least amount of backlash from the left, the least amount of censorship from big tech, if any at all, whereas the publications who took a pro-Trump stance, even if only in moderation, they had to take a lot for doing that. And so what I've noticed, and what sets off an alarm in my head, is that the same publications who were never Trump back in 2016 and who were basically Trump neutral for the last four years are now coming out as total DeSantis fanboys. And the implication is that DeSantis is to carry Donald Trump's torch. But if that were the case, if he could really carry that same torch, you would expect to see them treat him the same way that they treated Trump, but they don't. And this is because, in my opinion, DeSantis is not actually a threat to the establishment. More importantly, he can't carry the torch that, whether or not we like to admit it, was lit by Donald Trump. And again, I don't say this because I dislike DeSantis. I like him a lot, but I like you guys more, and so I'm just going to be honest with you, and we'll get more into it as we go along, but... I think that Ron DeSantis basically represents Trumpism without Trump, or in other words, not Trump. He has the good policy instincts, he has the right rhetoric, just like Trump, but without the implicit threat to the establishment, and the establishment knows that. But I know we all really like DeSantis, and I do too, so just bear with me, I will explain, but first, product mode. You know what I love more than this? My firearms. And the only thing I love more than my firearms is practicing with them. But with the cost of ammo through the roof, I was looking for a cost-effective, safe, and simple way to practice. iTarget was invented to give law-abiding gun owners a better way to train in the safety and privacy of their own home. No more inconvenient trips to the range or expensive practice ammunition. Just download iTarget's proprietary app, load the laser bullet into your firearm, and start your training experience. Dry fire training will help develop muscle memory, sharpen target reaction speeds, sight alignment, trigger function, and more. iTarget Pro comes in all the major calibers, including 223 for your AR, so you can stay sharp with almost any firearm. Go to iTargetPro.com and save 10%, plus get free shipping with the offer code DOYLE. This is the smartest way for you to practice and to pace for yourself in literally one day. That's the letter I, iTargetPro.com, iTargetPro.com, offer code DOYLE. Very epic. Let's talk a little bit about Ron DeSantis' background here. I guess my thesis is that He's a good guy, but he can't be the next guy, so to speak. And before we get into that, I want to address a very common objection to these types of things, which is that, oh, John, you're dividing the right. We can't win unless we're united. And I think this is a well-meaning criticism, but it's also a fundamental misunderstanding of how politics works. Firstly, I'm not even going to be criticizing DeSantis necessarily, especially not in the way that I tend to criticize fake conservatives, neoconservatives, etc. But that being said, that criticism kind of presupposes that politics is like this big team effort. The more people we have, the better. And there is some truth to that, but ultimately what is going to achieve victory for us depends on who controls the most influence, the most infrastructure, the most capital, the most resources, etc. And those things are finite, especially because we don't have enough time to build our own anymore. And so it's not only legitimate, but imperative that if we see someone occupying crucial volume within right-wing politics who is not operating at the necessary level for whatever reason, we have to criticize that because otherwise we're just setting ourselves up for failure. So 
There's that. But yeah, DeSantis, he went to Yale, got a history degree, and then he went to Harvard Law School for his JD. And to me, this is kind of like the first red flag because attendance at Ivy League schools doesn't make you smarter, and the quality of the education isn't even better than what you'd receive at like any top 50 school in the country. But what it does do is open doors. It gets you into the club. Now, does this mean that everyone who goes to Ivy League schools is an elitist who wants to sell out the American people to benefit themselves and their friends? No. But... There is a trend that exists where if you look at all of the people who are like that, they tend to go to Ivy League schools. And because we have been betrayed by decades of corrupt and incompetent Republican leadership, we have to come down on these people hard. We have to leave no stone unturned because if we just blindly put our trust into whoever we're told is our guy, yet again, we're just asking to get burned. The other thing that's worth addressing is his military background. After law school, he joined the Navy. Sure, he did a fantastic job. I thank him for his service, but part of me wonders if that was simply to participate in a phenomenon that exists and we find almost exclusively on the right, which is that people who have military backgrounds are automatically more electable. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. I'm not here to say for sure, but I am here to remind you that in the first television advertisement that DeSantis did when he was running for governor in 2018, it opens up like, Ron DeSantis, Iraq War veteran, with his picture of him in his gear, he's holding a rifle, but his work in the Navy was basically just as a legal consultant. Again, I appreciate that, I like him a lot, I'm just saying, advertising yourself as, Ron DeSantis, Iraq War veteran, here's a picture of me with a rifle, that sends a particular message, which is a lot different than Ron DeSantis, I worked for the Navy basically as a legal consultant. Do you get what I mean? Like, you watch the commercial, and what it implies is a lot different from the reality of it. And again, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. Maybe that's just good advertising. I'm simply questioning everything because this guy is a rising star in right-wing politics. He's getting a lot of attention, and he's doing a lot of good things. But my job is to make sure that we are not setting ourselves up to get burned again. Because right now, it seems to me that you have a guy who's been maneuvering for quite some time to get into political office. I think that that goes back to his Ivy League school attendance. I think that he joined the Navy because he knew that it would be advantageous to his public image and right-wing politics. And again, these things aren't necessarily bad, but if we're comparing him to Trump, then we have to at least note that DeSantis's background suggests that he's been maneuvering for political office for a long time. Whereas Trump was vaguely interested in politics, probably more so just getting his opinion out there uh, into the public because, you know, his ego, basically. And then he took it up as a hobby, ended up becoming the literal president of the United States. You could argue that Trump was maneuvering for office too, I guess. But again, that would really just come down to him wanting to broadcast his opinion on things to the public. He wasn't making like seriously big moves that would lay the foundation for that later on. Trump Tower wasn't for a presidential run. The Apprentice wasn't for a presidential run. And this is important because to truly be a threat to the system, you sort of have to be an outsider, right? You kind of have to, at this point, just take up politics as a hobby. And I look at someone like DeSantis, and it seems to me like he's been planning on climbing the ladder within the system for quite some time. Which again, that's not necessarily bad, but it is different from Trump. And I don't know that someone like that can truly carry the torch and be effective and be an effective threat to the system because the system is very good at preserving itself. And I suppose the obvious objection would be, well, Trump is a literal billionaire. He went to Wharton School of Business. That's Ivy League. That's all true, but it really isn't the same with Wharton because it is essentially true that Trump only got to go there because of his family connections and even with his status as an elite in society. He never really spoke like one of them. He never really behaved like one of them. His lifestyle was never really like their lifestyles. It was actually sort of like a caricature of what an elite person would live like, like living at the top of golden skyscrapers with your name at the top in every major city. Like, I think Trump always felt like, despite his success, he was never really in the club. Like, sure, he'd be friends with these people publicly, they'd attend each other's weddings, but he was never really in the club. And I think he's always felt a lot of resentment towards them because of that, which just so happens to be very good for the American people. So I think it is fair to say that in terms of what would comprise the foundation of a person who was actually a threat to the establishment, which I think we can all agree is the person that we need at this point, I see it with Trump very well, and I don't see it as much with DeSantis. Like, Trump really does resent the elites. Maybe because he loves us, maybe because they chipped his ego. Doesn't really matter to me. But I don't think that DeSantis necessarily shares this attitude. Now, remember last year, we made our predictions for what would happen if Trump lost. Uh, we predicted that people would be propped up on the right by the media, by the NGOs, and these people would basically be branded as the future of the Republican Party. We predicted that they would essentially embody the the ethos of the principled conservative that we were trying to break free from in terms of policy and even uh, an attitude to a certain degree, but they would also retain the most obvious elements of Trumpism, at least like what is most observable on the surface without carrying over the core of it, without carrying over what made it so powerful. And I think that's basically what we're seeing now. And I don't think that DeSantis intends for that to happen. I don't think that he's like in on it or something, but what I see is essentially the friend-enemy distinction, and it's raising some red flags for me. 
I am seeing the same people who demonized President Trump when he was first running, who were effectively silent while he was in office. They kept their mouths shut while they collected money from the energy that he created as the leader of this political movement. And now they're all very excited about Ron DeSantis, and that makes me very skeptical. And of course, the left is giving DeSantis a hard time. They always will. But it is not nearly as bad as how they treated President Trump and are still treating President Trump. And I think that there's something to be said about that. We have to remember, too, especially that the only thing worse than the enemy is the traitor. The reason we have lost our country isn't because our enemy is stronger or smarter than we are, but rather because the people who have promised us that they would represent us, that they would push back on our behalf, they have all betrayed us and sold us out. So the question becomes this. Why are known traitors of the American people propping up Ron DeSantis? Why do they want DeSantis 2024? Why is he supposed to carry the torch? It's because DeSantis is president, assuming he wins, assuming they let him win. That does two things. One, it provides Trumpism without Trump. You've got the policy instincts. You've got the tell it like it is. Get own journalist attitude, but without the implicit threat to the system. And secondly, it would cripple the ability of Florida to be an example for competent right-wing government at the state level. Think about it. If DeSantis goes to Washington, who's going to replace him in Florida? Probably no one. The system would prefer that Ron DeSantis is held hostage in Washington, D.C. because it will cripple him. As we learned with President Trump, the system is so good at preserving itself at the federal level that it is close to impossible to get anything done. And then the same would probably then be the case in Florida because it isn't obvious to me that there's anyone of DeSantis' caliber who would be waiting to replace him as governor. Let's even talk about that. Let's talk about DeSantis as governor, because that's important as well. We know that before uh, he was governor, he spent some time in D.C. in the House of Representatives. And this is one of the pro-DeSantis arguments. Well, DeSantis was in D.C. He knows how to navigate the swamp. That's why he's so effective. Trump never got anything done. I don't think that's exactly correct. DeSantis being in D.C. is less likely to mean that he knows how to navigate the swamp than it is to mean that he's a part of the swamp. And the reason Trump wasn't effective wasn't because he didn't know how. It was more because the swamp had constructed goal line defense to prevent him from doing anything. And a big part of that was literally infiltrating his administration with people who were subversive, ultimately, to his agenda. Like, was that in part his fault? Sure, I'm not making excuses for him. I'm just pointing out that operating at the federal level bears significantly more impediments than at the state level. And even at the state level... What has made DeSantis so effective? Is he effective or do we think he's effective? Are things getting done or are we reading headlines that are engineered to get clicks by implying that things are getting done? I'll tell you this much, I really like a lot of what DeSantis has done, especially with COVID, but I actually read a lot of these bills, these epic DeSantis bills, and frankly, a lot of them are what we warned would happen. A lot of them are just manufactured, exaggerated political victories and political theater. They're like a pressure release valve. They give us just enough to think that we're winning, but ultimately, they're toothless. Take the big tech bill, for example. You saw the headlines. You saw DeSantis takes on big tech. Now, take a second. Ask yourself this question. What do I think that means? And what do I think needs to happen to big tech? And how closely are those two things? Because here's the bill. Here's what it does. It says the tech companies have to let you know when they change their rules. Cool. And it says that they can't ban Floridian political candidates. Okay, cool. Are we protecting all constitutional free speech in Florida? Are we reinstating banned journalists and outlets in Florida, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Not exactly. And say what you will about President Trump, but at least his 230 approach would have been better than this. His problem is that he waited too long to actually follow through with it. It is what it is, but the execution would have been better. But even with the issues that DeSantis is pushing back against, things like banning conservatives from the new public square, locking down the country indefinitely, teaching your children that they are racist if they are white, and that America is inherently racist, those are all extreme measures from the left. And so the question becomes this, is simply being in opposition to the left being especially bad indicative of the ability to carry the torch? Is simply being willing to take a stand against the left when they crank their onslaught up to 100% and even then sometimes still pulling punches, is that indicative of an ability to really carry the torch in the way that we need? The man who lit the torch came out and asked, when's the last time you saw a Chevrolet in Tokyo? He said that we were going to build a wall to stop criminals from pouring into our country, etc., etc. The focus was on the core issues, the issues that define our nation. That's why the torch was lit. Do we need to take a stand against CRT? Yes, lockdowns. Yes, of course we do. But I don't know that a man who has become a star by opposing the left when they're at their worst is ready or able to carry the torch of a man who became a star by being willing to expose the core issues that have caused the decline of our national identity and which have been purposefully ignored by the mainstream media and politicians for decades. That's all I'm saying. Basically, any legitimate criticism of Trump can be correctly extended to Ron DeSantis as well. And illegitimate criticisms would be things like, Oh, my tweets! 
But Trump is off-putting, which are actually good for us, but there are a lot of things that Trump provides that DeSantis just can't or won't. Like, think about that. Think about the Trump effect. I can drive through any part of this country still, and I do, and see people displaying Trump flags, Trump signs, yard pieces that they made themselves, everything. There's a reason for that. The Trump effect is real. I like Ron DeSantis a lot, but whatever that is, he just doesn't have it. He just doesn't have the charisma that Trump does, and he'll never have the anti-establishment appeal that Trump has. Maybe slightly, but it will never be the same. He won't get 75 million votes. He won't have people waiting in line for hours, days, to see him speak. He just won't. And that doesn't mean he's a bad guy, but Ron DeSantis will just never have the cultural impact that Donald Trump has had and does have. He just doesn't have the ability. And we really take it for granted, but Donald Trump really is something special. And we're probably never going to see something like him again in our lifetimes. And because that's where the party is right now, that's where the momentum is, that's where the energy is, still. So we need to utilize it while we can. Not try to redirect it somewhere else, not try to have Trumpism without Trump. No, we still need Donald J. Trump and all of his flaws and all of his strengths. He has to be our leader right now. And until someone else comes along who can properly carry the torch, and I only see one person who could potentially do it, and it isn't Ron DeSantis right now. And it brings me no joy to tell you this, by the way. I like DeSantis a lot. I want him to be the guy, but he just doesn't have the same potential as Trump. And he falls into the same traps that Trump did. You know, I'm watching people like, boom, DeSantis strikes again. This is called getting stuff done. And then I'm watching him, you know, he's promoting the jab. I'm watching him spend time using state power, attacking Ben and Jerry's because they weren't nice enough to Israel. And I'm just like... There goes my hero. <laughs> you know, and I think that's ultimately the goal with DeSantis. Like, I think he's a good guy. He wants to do right by the American people. But I think that the establishment knows that he's easier to control. And so they're trying to prop him up as the successor to Trump for exactly that reason. And if that happens, I think it would be a return to the status quo of post-war American conservatism, masquerading as Trumpism by giving the press a harder time by maybe taking a harder stance against illegal immigration, but only because it's not fair to the hardworking legal immigrants who are just as American as you and I. Just look at that literally one group of them in Florida, the Cuban immigrants who don't like communism. I like those people, by the way, a lot. I do. But we have to understand that they are the exception, not the rule, and we need to govern based on the rule. Being an American just means nothing anymore. Nobody even cares about this country. It's, it's like, it's a shopping mall. Why do you think the Olympic viewership is the lowest it's been in over 30 years? It's not just because it's too political now. It's because there is no national pride anymore. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. But yeah, you know, you'd maybe get something against big tech, but only because they're allowing for anti-Semitism on their platforms. You'd get basically the same foreign policy as before Trump. And I say this because I think that we can fairly extrapolate that someone who is effectively a product of the establishment, the Ivy League to Washington, D.C. pipeline, and who more importantly doesn't seem to invoke the same fear within the establishment that Trump did, I just don't think that he would be able to carry the torch. And think about what else that would mean. Assuming he runs in 2024, let's say he wins. Now, like we said, he's crippled in D.C. Look at what DeSantis has right now. DeSantis has more power now than he would as president. He controls anti-communist Latinos, comically well-armed baby boomers, and equally comically well-armed Southern in the panhandle. That's not nothing. Besides, the reality of our situation is that, as much as we would like it to happen, you know, there's probably never going to be national unity again. And if it does happen, it's going to be much further down the road than right now. Right now, what we need are state governors to be competent, to wield power effectively, and to set examples for other governors in red states to do the same. Because right now, DeSantis is probably the best example that we have, and even he could be doing better. Because the most important thing is that the swamps aren't as deep at the state level, right? It's a lot easier for good people to obtain power at the state level and for them to use that power for good than it is at the federal level. And that's what we need to be doing. And that's what Ron DeSantis needs to be doing. That's where we need him right now. Everybody has a role. Everybody has a role to play. Everyone has talents. My understanding of the situation is that DeSantis isn't the guy to lead the movement. He's not the guy to carry the torch right now, but he can do a great job as the governor of Florida. He can do an even better job than he's doing now, and he is doing good. We have to hold him to a high standard because we can't afford to do anything less. So it's not that we're criticizing him, trying to tear him down, but just that we need the absolute best from him, and that's what the strategy has to be. Not assuming everyone who we like or who gets us excited is going to be the guy to carry the torch, but that everybody knows themselves, knows their skills, knows their role, and then we can all move forward in the right direction so that we can actually take our country back one state at a time, one election at a time. We have to be very careful with this. It's a long process. We have to hold people accountable. We have to demand high standards because clearly what we've been doing for the last 80 years hasn't been working. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications so of course you are notified when I post. <laughs> when I post, not if I post, when I post. Content imminent. And then, of course, share the video with a friend. I think this was a good video. I think we provided a fair analysis of the situation. Not out of contempt or 
or ill will. We like DeSantis. We just, you know, I like you guys more, and so I'm just being honest. We're not dividing the party. We're making it better. We're holding people to high standards. Don't hold me to a... Actually, no. Do hold me to a high standard. That's it. Am I going to get shot with paintballs if I don't upload consistently? Probably. Are you doing that out of hatred? No. You're doing that because you expect the best out of me, and I appreciate that. And I extend that expectation, rooted in good, to Governor DeSantis. Right? Right. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. May God bless America.